Good morning, everybody, and this is Political Brew. I'm Zach Blanchard. Joining me this morning, our analysts, Democrat Ethan Strimling and Republican Phil Harriman. Good morning to you Good both. morning. Good morning. Good, Good to morning, see you. Ethan. Good morning, buddy. <laughs> Let's get right to it. Kicking the can down the road. That's how one lawmaker is describing the stopgap funding bill that passed through Congress late this week, averting another shutdown. Now, this is the third time a measure like this has passed since September. Democrats and Republicans just can't find common ground on a full government spending bill because they're still at odds over funding for Israel and Ukraine, as well as the southern border. The vast majority of members of Congress support aid to Ukraine. The question is whether or not a small minority are going to hold it up. This could be a disaster. Ethan, we'll start with you. What will this take? Should Democrats give more here on the border? Well, just to be clear, Democrats and Republicans have actually come to agreement. They've come to agreement on a Ukraine package aid funding the government. It is merely about 100 Republicans in the House who are blocking this, right? The Senate came together. They had an agreement. Leadership actually had an agreement. And then these 100 Republicans, MAGA Republicans, who are just blocking this effort. So as President Biden just said, there is widespread support in Congress for this. A minority is blocking this aid they are the ones who have got to figure out how to step back and get it done. Uh, how do you convince them, Phil? Well, two points. First, uh, Congress now for more than a decade has been passing budgets like this behind closed doors, small group of people put out a big, you know, hundreds if not thousands of pages of bills and say, if you don't pass it, the government's going to shut down. They got to they got to start doing their legislative job. And two, uh, I, I think most Americans agree that we need to protect our southern border. We cannot continue to have millions of people come in here who we don't know who they are. And I think for Republicans to say, if you want money for Ukraine or Israel, let's also protect our own border. Let's be very clear about something, though. That f first of all, we don't have millions of people coming in here who we don't know who we, they are. They're coming in. We know who we, they are. We process them, right? So let's not try to create this uh, chaos or fear that doesn't exist. A and the second piece is around the Congress. I agree with you, but that's what Mike Johnson said he was going to do. He said, as Speaker, I am going to now create a process f where we are actually going to do a budget instead of this. And he's failed. This has become a, a big issue in the presidential race. Republican frontrunner Donald Trump was in court and on the campaign trail this week. This is his defamation case involving E. Jean Carroll, who accused the former president of sexual assault. The judge even threatened to throw Trump out of the courtroom at one point because of his behavior. Here's what Trump had to say about him in New Hampshire. He's a nasty judge. He's a Trump hating guy. Now, Phil, is this the right approach to take here? No. <laughs> My goodness. I mean, how can you defend that? It, it, you go to court to have justice. And, uh, at, you know, at one point I understand um, someone in the court, I was a lawyer, the judge says, does anyone think uh, President Trump has been treated unfairly? And President Trump raised his hand as if to say, yeah, I, I do feel I've been treated unfairly. You go into court, it's a solemn occasion. It's there to determine the law, and uh, he should conduct himself accordingly. Ethan? Yeah, you know, your statement earlier about saying he was on the campaign trail after he was in court, that's a phrase that we are going to be repeating over and over and over and have been because uh, he has obviously 91 indictments plus this civil trial. Now look, we're only at this civil trial because he refused to accept the first uh, ruling in which he was fined, and he went after her again, and that's the problem. He just will not accept, even when a court tells him, that he was wrong, even when he loses an election that he lost, he won't ever accept it, and that's why we continue to be in this problem. But his supporters don't seem to mind either. His supporters, you know, I, I, I am not going to pretend that I understand where their supporters are coming from, but you're right, his supporters don't. It's the leadership and the party who should really stand up and say, you know what, this is not okay by us. You know, I, I think it's worth mentioning it. The, these are Americans who are supporting him. We're not, they're, they're basically saying, you know, you guys have used the rule of law to weaponize weaponize uh, the election process, and I think more and more people are saying, you know, put them on the ballot and let us decide. All right, speaking of the ballot, former Maine GOP chair Demi Kazuna says she plans to run against independent Senator Angus King. It is not official yet, but Kazuna tells us she received a call from Senator Susan Collins this week encouraging her to run. She adds, quote, we need a woman's vote. Ethan, we want to be clear here. Demi was an analyst here on The Brew. Um, is this Senator Collins piece surprising? It is, and it'll be very interesting to hear what Senator Collins ultimately says about this. You know, 
oftentimes people who are in positions like that will call people who are thinking about running and will be encouraging and say, hey, you ought to think about this. Whether or not that's an official endorsement, that's a big step. So uh, if Demi just made a very big mistake, which she might have made, that's going to be a real problem for her. But look, this is an uphill battle, very tough. Angus King is really going to be hard to beat. So uh, I don't think it will matter necessarily whether Senator Collins fully endorses her. Phil? You know, I, I think it's unfortunate that Senator Collins is the, the news story here. Uh, Demi has decided to run and good for her and all the best. But uh, I, I think, you know, from a collegial point of view, and I think it bears even in the state Senate, let alone the U.S. Senate, where, you know, your colleagues and the thought that you're going to find a way to unseat one of your colleagues uh, from the same state or the same district uh, is not good for internal relations. Yeah, but I would say you would imagine that if she gets the nomination, Collins will endorse her. I mean, I don't think Collins sure, is ever yeah. going to endorse King. No, no. But I, my, my point is that uh, I, I, let's hear from Senator Collins uh, yeah. and what she had to say. We'll see. In Augusta, big news for the embattled Department of Health and Human Services this week. Maine's child welfare system has a new leader, Bobby Johnson. Now, Johnson has been with the Office of Child and Family Services for 25 years. The department also announced staff working with Children's Behavioral Health will shift to the Office of Behavioral Health. And there's a plan for an outside review of how the system as a whole is organized. Chris Costa spoke to Johnson this week. There's been a lot of scrutiny on the Office of Child and Family Services lately. Do you feel that that scrutiny is warranted? I recognize that there are problems and that we have a lot of work to do to improve the system. I know that staff are frustrated and I share that frustration. And I also have optimism and hope for where we're going to move to in the future. Phil, will this make a difference? Boy, I sure hope so. There are too many kids uh, who have been in harm's way and we cannot let that continue. I. I don't know how you reinvent and reimagine a system that is so fundamentally failing children and do that with the same people who were in charge before. Ethan? Yeah, and why couldn't she just answer Chris's question by saying yes? I mean, that like pause in which she's trying to figure out when he says, is there a problem? And she tries to reframe it, that's the problem. And I, Phil's exactly right. They needed somebody to come in from the outside, somebody significant. Go out, find somebody who's dealt with issues like this before and shake things up. And they also need to truly separate the department, right? They can't do this little game of shuffling things around. This is, as Phil said, we all are hoping and praying that they start to get this right. But so far, the Mills administration, this has just been a, a real black mark on her, uh, on her tenure. Is it on the governor, Phil? Ultimately, of course, she's the chief executive officer. Those uh, departments report to her. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to take a quick break. The Weekend Morning Report is back right after this. Good morning, everybody. This is Political Brew. Joining me once again, Democrat Ethan Strimling and Republican Phil Harriman. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good Thanks morning. for being here. Yeah. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. I want to start with the big news in the Trump ballot drama. Secretary of State Shanna Bellows is appealing the decision by a Superior Court justice. Now, this comes after a ruling by the justice that left it up to Bellows to essentially decide whether former President Donald Trump can appear on Maine's primary ballot pending the ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court on a case out of Colorado. Secretary Bellows and Colorado State Supreme Court came to similar conclusions, saying Trump isn't eligible to be on the primary ballots for his alleged involvement in the January 6th insurrection. Now, once the Supreme Court makes a ruling, the Maine Justice says Bellows can modify, withdraw, or confirm her prior decision. Ethan, we know you have been involved in this process. How do you expect the justices, the Supreme Court justices, to rule in this case? Well, I can't predict that for sure. What I know is that the decision that came out of the Superior Court, it really was no decision, and that was the problem. It just sent it back to Shenna. So we're all waiting for the U.S. Supreme Court, right? That is where this is going to ultimately land, and they have an aggressive timeline. But if it's still sitting in front of Shenna Bellows, once that Supreme Court rules, we then have another five or six weeks of possible appeals, and it's too far out. So I think Secretary Bellows was correct. Look, we need an answer to this question. I believe that Donald Trump is not qualified, right? The Constitution says you incite insurrection, you're not allowed to serve an office if you've been serving an office at that time. Hopefully the U.S. Supreme Court will uphold the rule of law and uphold our Constitution, but the way the Superior Court rule judged, uh, ruled, uh, it just left it in too much limbo. So this hopefully will get us an answer. 
Bill, is she just looking for some cover here? Well, partly, but I also think if you're sitting here watching the political brew with your first cup of coffee this morning, you probably got a headache just listening to the process <laughs> that we're discussing here. Yeah. And that's what's frustrating to most Americans is that this is all administrative procedures and appeals and let's get the Supreme Court to make a decision and move on. Well, but that, that's important, right? Uh, of course it's administrative, but this is a very important question that our country has got to get right, right? Does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment apply? Does it apply to every elected official in the country except the president? Is what Donald Trump did on January 6th insurrection? And therefore, is that person qualified to run for president again? Those are huge questions. So these administrative procedures help to make sure that we get that answer correct. But I think the main Superior Court is saying, let the U.S. Supreme Court correct. weigh in yeah. on this and right. we'll go from there instead of making a decision here at the state level that then perhaps the, the Supreme Court overturns. Well, but the problem is that they sent it back to the Secretary of State. So if, let's just say, let's say the U.S. Supreme Court rules that Colorado was uh, correct. Colorado, Trump should not be on the ballot. Donald Trump will appeal that decision at Shenna's office. So that means it's going to go through another six week process. We have to get it to our state Supreme Court because they can make a final determination. How about some Tylenol for all of our viewers I think this so. morning? Yeah, maybe another cup of coffee. <laughs> also happening this week in politics, the New Hampshire primary. I'll be there on the ground starting tomorrow. While the candidates are out there fighting for votes this year is anything but normal. President Joe Biden won't be on the ballot and Trump is still the apparent Republican front runner, though Nikki Haley appears to be gaining some ground. And Ron DeSantis, who got second in Iowa, is already looking ahead to South Carolina. Two debates scheduled this week that are traditions in New Hampshire were canceled because Haley refused to participate in them without Trump. If anyone is willing to debate, please let me know. 24 hours notice, I will be there. We don't want more of the same with the Trump-Biden thing. We don't want more of the same where we've got 80-year-olds in D.C. We don't want more of the same where both of them are distracted by investigations and all these other things. We deserve better. Phil DeSantis there obviously making fun of the situation. Do you think Haley will actually do well in New Hampshire? Well, uh, I think partly, yes, be, partly because... It's an open primary. Uh, independents can come and vote, uh, or Democrats can come and vote in the Republican uh, primary. And I think people who are not so happy with, with uh, Joe Biden and are definitely not happy with Trump are gonna put their support uh, behind uh, Nikki. But I don't think it's gonna be enough to overcome uh, the primary in New Hampshire. If she loses in South Carolina, uh, I would suspect it's over. All right, Even. Phil, we're betting a cup of coffee on this one because I predicted on this show a few weeks ago that Nikki Haley was going to win New Hampshire. I think it's still going to happen. Wow, so wow. Uh, I'm choosing the coffee shop where you buy me a cup of coffee when it occurs. But and I think I'm tuning in to Zach on Tuesday night. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> You'll both be here too. Actually, good point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I think Nikki Haley has a real shot here. I, I do think that, as Phil says, she's going to have a real shot here, win, lose, or draw, even if she were to win. Uh, South Carolina, which I think, uh, you know, she's going to do okay in, it's then just a plummeting after that. And Donald Trump walks away with this nomination. You know, uh, Ron DeSantis is just lost. I don't know what he's doing at this point. He's going to get crushed in New Hampshire. Why he thinks he can win South Carolina over Nikki Haley or Donald Trump is beyond me. So he's really a non-factor. Yeah, talking to some people on the ground, it seems that he's running out of money as well. Yeah. So, so we'll see how that shakes out. Um, I really want to talk about the issues, though, that matter to voters this year. You hear both sides kind of fighting for what those issues really are. But for New Hampshire um, voters specifically, I want you to basically just answer the question, matters, doesn't matter. Uh, so first did, up- Did you hear that? <laughs> I did. <laughs> oh, these women, wait, these elaborate. are Republican he'll voters elaborate. that I'm supposed to tell you whether it matters. I'm gonna tell you whether it should <laughs> matter. Succinct, succinct. <laughs> yeah. Boys, Okay. the border. <laughs> yes. Matters. Matters. Uh, it, to Republican voters, yes. But? But it shouldn't. Okay. It doesn't have any bearing on New Hampshire. Okay, the economy. Absolutely. It should. I don't think it does enough. Housing, Ethan. No. No, I don't think it moves the needle in New Hampshire. Huh. Student debt relief. Uh, yes, in a negative way. I think the, for giving student debt that someone else is going to pay off uh, does matter. Ethan. No, I, that barely come up in the campaign at this point. And lastly, health care. Ethan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it should matter, but the Republican voters just don't seem to care about it. So. so top issues appear to be economy and the border? Yes. All right. Let's wrap things up with winners and losers. Ethan, you're first. 
Look, Ron DeSantis, big loser, uh, I think, after Iowa. It's going to get even worse next week. And uh, I'm going to throw a winner out to Susan Collins because she did not. She's one of few Republicans in Congress who did not sign on to the brief supporting Donald Trump's right to be on the ballot in front of the Supreme Court. Good for her for staying out of that decision. Let the courts decide. Bill? Uh, my winner of the week are the presidential candidates in New Hampshire who aren't willing to debate. That's uh, why we have primaries. And so they're my lose. My winner this week is from my hometown of Yarmouth. Sophia Lockley uh, was the winner of the World Cup uh, cross country skiing Amazing. in Italy. Yeah, yes. Congrats to her. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both. That's going to do it for this week's political brew. Don't forget, meet the press coming up at nine. We'll also have coverage of the New Hampshire primary with these guys here throughout the week. The morning report is back right after this.